less than 50 meters apart in a section of space not far enough from a Lagrange point to look suspicious, but not so close that nearby clutter might disguise an eavesdropper. A laser link ensured that communications would be leakage-free and interception-free. Charles sat across from me, the coffee in his hand forgotten, his expression a mix of confusion, disbelief, and horror. I hastened to explain. This is just speculation on my part, or it started out that way anyway. When I went over the recent instances of vehement space-side sabotage, Homer was always a recent visitor. In a couple of cases, the only recent visitor. We'd been saying that nothing had been near the locations, but that's because we'd been discounting ourselves as suspects. But Homer? How? You remember the hacking attempt on me? I thought that was the only instance, but maybe it was the only instance that we detected. Vehement obviously has some heavy-duty tech on their side. Maybe they discovered another way in. So, what do we do? I looked down for a moment. This wasn't going to be easy to say. We have to disable Homer and check him out. We can apologize afterwards if I'm wrong. Remember the Battle of Sol? Investigation complete. File uploaded. Thanks, Guppy. I'll look at it when I have a chance. The file would be a summary of whatever the drones had found at the ground location of that suspicious transmission. I had made a point of disabling all radio comms on those drones and using secret key encryption and frequency jumping for the SCUT telemetry. I couldn't have intercepted and decoded that kind of setup if I'd been handed the information on a silver platter. I had to assume that the unknown opponent wasn't too much smarter than me, or I might as well just roll over and expose my throat. I sent Homer a message that I thought I knew where the next attack by vehement would be and that we needed a secure discussion. Charles, Homer, and I arranged to meet just to orbital north of the Earth-Moon L4 point. Homer coasted up and applied the brakes. Once we were at station keeping, we rotated to present our laser comms to each other. In an abundance of paranoia, I routed my communications through Sandbox Bob. Laser comms were intimate enough that if Homer had a virus, it might try to get to me via that connection. I told Charles to do the same. We connected up and Homer appeared in my VR. So, Riker, what's this big discovery? I took a sip of my coffee and privately looked over at Sandbox Bob. No reaction. Just waiting for Charles... I don't want to have to repeat myself and answer the same arguments twice. One of us can fill in Ralph later when he gets here. I looked up at the holotank where Charles was just coming up on our group. Charles linked up by laser comms and popped into the common VR. Hi, guys. Sup? In my private VR, Sandbox Bob grabbed his throat and fell over. I looked at Guppy, one eyebrow raised. Source of attack is Homer. I raised both hands in the air in the common VR and Charles put a steel ball right through Homer's reactor control system. Homer went dead as he lost all power, just as he had back in our battle with the Brazilian probes. I did a quick scan. Perfect shot. No collateral damage. Charles looked green, and I'm sure I did as well. We sent over a squad of roamers and unceremoniously cut into Homer's cargo bay. It took a few hours before we had Homer's matrix up on a test cradle. Now came the dirty part. Here it is. I pointed to the listing. It looks like the laser comms were the source of infection. I'm not sure when or how they would have gotten access, but in any case, it was brilliant. A hole in our defenses that I hadn't even considered. Charles nodded. Listen, Homer might not be the only one. You could be infected, although that seems unlikely, given that you're the one exposing the issue. Or I could be. My guppy saw the penetration attempt from Homer as well, so... Unless you're pulling some kind of double-reverse Maxwell smart thing, I think you're legit. I need you to do an inspection of my matrix to clear up any suspicions about me. Like they did in The Thing. He looked at me expectantly. I thought for a moment and nodded. It was a good idea and necessary. Charles would have to open his hangar doors, then shut down, but now that I knew what to look for, the actual check would take only minutes. I explained the requirements, and Charles did as instructed. A couple of roamers entered Charles's hull, and twenty minutes later, Charles was back up and running. 
Thanks, Charles. I can reciprocate if there's any lingering doubt in your mind. He shook his head. You could have infected me while I was off. Absolutely no reason for you not to. I'm good. We turned our attention back to Homer. It took thirty hours overall to clean up and repair him. The virus, or Trojan, or whatever you wanted to call it, had gotten its hooks into multiple systems. Homer would have had very little free will, but would be fully conscious. I shuddered, thinking what that must have been like. Ralph showed up in the midst of the process, and we had to explain the whole thing to him. While I was talking, Charles lined up with Ralph's reactor control system. When we pointed this out and explained the alternatives, Ralph quite rationally agreed to an inspection. Once Ralph was back up, clean, thankfully, we turned back to Homer. I removed the viral control, and I installed a freshly made firewall over the laser comms. None of us would be susceptible to that particular attack in the future. I also forwarded a complete report to Bill for him to add to the standard releases. Homer booted up. His avatar appeared in the common VR, looked surprised, then collapsed, screaming. The rest of us looked at each other in horror. Had I done something wrong? Had I damaged Homer? Homer, buddy, come back. You okay? I knelt beside him and put my hand on his shoulder. The screaming stopped, and he began to moan. He curled into a fetal position, squeezed his eyes shut, and rocked back and forth on the floor. I was at a complete loss. Original Bob hadn't been much for this kind of emotional contact, and I was self-aware enough to know that I was even more standoffish than he was. Ralph and Charles didn't look any more prepared. However, Homer didn't seem to be getting worse or harming himself, so we decided, in timeless male fashion, to leave things be and wait for him to get a grip. After a few more milliseconds, Homer gasped and opened his eyes. I was hag-ridden. The bastards had total control of me. They made me lie to you. They made me blow things up. They made me kill people. Homer began to cry, a hopeless moaning alternating with racking sobs. I couldn't do anything. I could only watch myself follow their orders. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't stop myself. I couldn't even kill myself. Bill popped into VR. I've been lurking since I got your report. This is unforgivable. I know we don't like violence, but if you feel the need to end the bastards that did this, no one will say boo. He sat on the floor beside Homer and put a hand on his back, simply maintaining human contact. I looked at Charles and Ralph. The expression on their faces said all that was needed. Someone was going to pay. Homer had come out of his funk, but he was still very fragile. Bill was gone after promising any help we might want in building anything we might need, up to and including things that explode. Yep, angry. Charles kept an eye on Homer while Ralph oversaw the construction of the replacement donut. Homer was gradually able to unwind himself and sit, but he would go into panic attacks from time to time. I suggested we enable his endocrine controls, but he shook his head emphatically. It feels too much like what they did to me. It's a leash. It's just a different leash. He waved a hand helplessly, trying to find words. It feels like claustrophobia or something. Just the idea of something controlling me makes me want to run around the room screaming. Okay, Homer, whatever you feel best about. Charles put a hand on his shoulder. We're here for you, whatever you need. Homer nodded to us and tried to smile, but it wasn't very reassuring. I had not attended the latest UN session. If Vehement had noticed that they'd lost their puppet, I didn't want to give them any more information. Let them think we'd all destroyed each other. Meanwhile, I looked over Guppy's report. The tight beam signal had come from what originally might have been a small military outpost high in the back country of New Zealand. It had some pretty hefty communications capability, judging from the visible hardware. Per my orders, the drones avoided using SUDAR scanning, as that would have been detectable. Instead, we stuck to passive surveillance techniques, visual and infrared pinpointed occupied areas, and gave an approximate head count. Audio snooping picked up some of the conversations, the contents of which left no doubt about who was in residence. 
This appeared to be vehement central. Even if they operated on a cell structure, without their tech central, they wouldn't be good for much in the future. I remembered the early hacking attempt, which had also originated from New Zealand. It was reasonable to assume that this had been an ongoing war for longer than I'd realized. Fine. War declared. But I wanted to be certain I caught the right people. The mastermind behind so complex a setup wouldn't be that easy to track down. I was sure there'd be at least one more hop to his location. I would take whatever amount of time, use whatever resources I needed to catch him, without limit. And when I did, there would be a reckoning. 29. Emergency. Howard, April 2190, Vulcan. Emergency at landing. I turned briefly to look at Guppy, but good news or bad, Guppy looked like Admiral Akbar. No help there. I turned back to my video call with Dr. Sheehy and said, Gotta go, and disconnected. I picked up the video connection that Guppy was holding for me. It was Stefan. Howard, we've got a group of raptors that somehow got through the fence. They're running through town looking for prey. Last known location? Stefan gave me a cross street. I knew that security would be converging on the location, but the raptors could move fast, much faster than a human. I had only two busters close enough to be useful, but I had all the drones that were part of the automated surveillance system. As well, several backup units were parked on top of the administration building, sitting in their cradles. I activated the backups and sent all units to the reported location. Halfway there, the two busters blew past the flock of drones, doing close to Mach 1. I was now juggling 18 separate units. Even with most of them slaved to a primary, it was hard to keep track. I dismissed my VR and frame-jacked up high enough so that I could multitask. The busters were coming up on the reported location, but I couldn't see any raptors. I split off a couple of drones and sent them up to a kilometer altitude, activating high-res, infrared, and motion detection sensors. Security personnel were approaching from several directions. There were only two streets that the raptors could be on, and there was no sign of them. Could Brodeur have been wrong? A quick check of the video surveillance streams eliminated that possibility. Either raptors could become invisible, wouldn't that be a kicker, or they'd found somewhere to hide. I brought all the drones down to a few feet above ground and started a search pattern for raptor prints. The drones took off in different directions, following anything that was even remotely print-like. Shivying all these units was really wearing on me, even in frame jack. I had to keep track of what orders each unit was following. So I guess I don't feel too bad that it took me a couple of missed cycles before I realized one of the units wasn't responding. I pulled up the video log for that unit, and... Wow, that's what the inside of a raptor mouth looks like. Good to know. The raptor pack had gone to ground inside someone's storage shed. I guess one of them decided he should take out the flying thing before it raised the alarm. Even acknowledging that they couldn't know about radio, that was intelligent behavior. Bill and I would be discussing this one. Meanwhile, I sent all units to surround the shed, dropped my frame rate to real time, and called Stefan. The drones and busters arrived and took up positions around the shed, and the moment they did that, the raptors made a break for freedom. They dodged through the circle of drones, leaped a fence, and made a beeline for the perimeter. It would be a coin toss whether any of the security people could get into position to take them out, and at the speed the raptors were moving, there wouldn't be much opportunity. Hopefully civilians would have heard the alert and had enough sense to stay indoors. Stefan, have they killed anyone? Not to my knowledge, but we'll be checking out this out. No, never mind. I see some faces looking out the window. Someone just gave me a thumbs up, so no, no casualties. Okay, they're out of range of you guys now. I don't have enough space to get my busters up to speed anyway, so I'm going to let them go. Maybe they'll spread the word. Tabernacle, you think they can talk? Um, probably not, but maybe they can teach caution through their behavior. Oh, and guess what? Seems raptors can dig, too. Wonderful. I looked down at the hole through which the raptors were wriggling. It must have been seven or eight feet deep at the low point. Looked like we would be upgrading the fences. Again. Things just get more and more complicated. 
Colonel Butterworth had his head propped up in one hand, elbow in his desk. Cranston and Volta are starting to look like the smart ones. The colonel didn't expect an answer. I think he just needed a drinking buddy. I had a cognac from Sam's template. I was really getting used to the taste, and I just nodded. Truthfully, the raptor invasion hadn't resulted in any fatalities, and we were already starting on getting the fences fixed. Metal rods driven down 20 feet, spaced six inches apart, would take care of the digging issue. And Bridget, Dr. Sheehy, that is, had a device almost perfected that could detect parasite infection through body odor. No blood tests required. Just wave your hand over it as you go by. Those would be installed in all building entrances as soon as she had all the uh, bugs out. Longer term, we hope to thin the parasites out to the point of eventual extinction. Meanwhile, she'd come up with a name for the thing, Cupid Bug, because, as she explained, it went for the heart. I had to admit I appreciated Bridget's sense of humor. I also had several small batches aging of something that might turn out to be a replacement for Jameson. Or for paint thinner. Time would tell. The colonel and I discussed a few miscellaneous items, but nothing really pressing. The council, as expected, had caved without a fight on the subject of Bronto burgers. Let's face it, one of the damn things would keep the entire colony in stakes for a couple of weeks. We wouldn't need to kill many. And the alternative was still kudzu. I said goodbye to the colonel and popped out. On a whim, I activated one of the surveillance drones. I took it up a couple of kilometers and did a slow pan. The sun was going down in the west, and it was a magnificent sight. From the surface of Vulcan, Omicron squared Eridani appeared almost a third bigger than Earth's sun. As a K-type star, it had a slightly more orange cast, although you stopped noticing it after a day or so. But the additional output in the red end of the spectrum meant that even the most run-of-the-mill sunsets were spectacular by Earth standards. And today wasn't run-of-the-mill. Scattered clouds were all that were left of the recent thunderstorms, but those clouds glowed in the sky like individual wildfires. The forest-slash-jungle stretched horizon to horizon, hugging the hills and only reluctantly leaving the occasional rocky crag uncovered. Something like birds swooped and twirled in flocks that wouldn't have been seen on Earth since the days of the passenger pigeon. If you could ignore all the things with big shark teeth and the other things that could accidentally squish you between their toes, it was a kind of paradise. Oh, yeah, and the things that laid eggs in you. Ew! 30. Found something. Bashful. November 2187, Gleese 877. We'd all taken off in different directions per Mario's orders. I picked GL 877, a nondescript star in a forgettable patch of sky. For all we knew, these others might not be planet based or even system based, but we had to start somewhere. At minimum, we'd be mapping their path of destruction. We have radio traffic. Guppy pushed a window toward me. As I examined the readings, my eyebrows climbed up my forehead. The radio noise coming from this system was clearly artificial. One way or the other, something intelligent lived here. Something noisy. Every possible caution, Guppy. Let's take it slow. I don't want to attract attention. Understood. And prep the stealth probes. I'd have been cautious anyway, but given the possibility that this was the others, I was going to give paranoia a brand new level of definition. I had spent my time during transit building a couple of stealth probes. I'd had to sacrifice some busters and some roamers, but the result was a couple of probes that would be almost undetectable unless they cranked up to full power. I had constructed them out of carbon fiber matrix ceramic and non-ferrous metal wherever possible. The others would have to be specifically looking for one of these in order to detect it. I'd already squirted the plans back to Mario as part of my continuous reporting. I was still going about 5% of light speed, so I lined up just below the ecliptic and released one probe. I altered my line slightly, then released the other. It would take just under two weeks for the probes to free fall through the system. Meanwhile, I would take a powered flight path, which would take me to the rendezvous point on the other side 
without my going anywhere near the inner system. Unless the residents had far better detection systems than we did, they'd never know I was here. I had carefully laid out parameters in which the probes would run for it and conditions in which they'd self-destruct. There would be no chances taken. In either case, once discovered, a probe would abandon attempts at stealth and squirt all telemetry to my calculated position. With my powered flight plan, I arrived at the rendezvous several days before the probes, on a vector straight outward from the system. The probes hit the brakes and activated their beacons as they came within range. I downloaded their data and transmitted the whole bundle in Mario's direction before beginning my own analysis. It took about two days to build a coherent picture of the inner system. There were two lonely inner rocky planets and a single small Jovian farther out. The inner of the two rocky planets appeared to have an atmosphere. The other had been too far away from either probe to get details, but it appeared to have a surprisingly high albedo. The system seemed to be particularly free of debris, except in an orbit about 80% of the orbital radius of the inner planet. At that distance from the sun, there was a truly spectacular amount of mass and activity spread right around the orbit. That whole area was, in fact, responsible for most of the electromagnetic activity in the system. I turned to Guppy and pointed at the mass concentration. What the crap is that? Insufficient information, but we can rule out a natural satellite. Not a planet? Correct. The mass is too diffuse. I wished I had someone besides Guppy to discuss this with. The plan had been to build a second wave of bobs back at Gliese 54 and send them to catch up with the first wave. So, within perhaps six months, I could be getting company. Hopefully the new bob had been picking up my transmissions and had a good idea of how to approach... I was sitting more than six billion kilometers from the local sun, in some of the emptiest space I could imagine. So it was a shock when the proximity alarms started sounding. I frame-jacked up to maximum and started to evaluate the readings. Something was approaching at high speed, and the something apparently had a very well-shielded reactor because it was Sudar that had picked it up. A quick set of calculations showed that I wouldn't be able to win a straight foot race. It or they were approaching too fast. It was time for our tried-and-true doubling-back tactic. I had no idea what their maneuverability was like, so I calculated a conservative option and began accelerating at a 35-degree angle to their approach vector. The other ships reacted almost immediately, which told me they had SUDAR detection capability. Light-speed limitations would have meant almost an hour's delay before they could respond to my movement. The tableau developed slowly over the next several hours. Like a game of chess, everything was on the table. There would be no surprise tactics. The laws of physics would decide if I got past them. However, it was already obvious that closest approach would be, well, pretty close. It took almost a day to reach that point. I spent the time scanning them with everything at my disposal. Sadar and visuals confirmed six vessels, five very similar to the wrecked cargo ship, and one that honestly reminded me of a miniature Death Star. Miniature being a relative term, the thing was almost a half kilometer in diameter. Instead of an inset dish like the Star Wars prop, it had a flat section with what looked like a grid. I hoped the purpose wasn't similar. Finally, the laws of physics and reality made themselves clear, and I realized that I was going to sail past them less than ten kilometers away. That was cutting it a little fine, but I'd take it. As I was nearing closest approach and getting ready to thumb my virtual nose at the pursuers, I saw the Death Star wannabe start to rotate, bringing the grid wall to bear on me. This is not good. Guppy, anything we can do about shielding? All resources are at maximum. I calculated that I could do a certain amount of jinking without losing my lead. I immediately started evasive maneuvers. However, the others had made the same calculations. The Death Star simply waited until I ran out of slack and zeroed in. The grid started to glow. Then there was a... P Alert! Controller replicant offline. Surge drive offline. Requirements for self-destruct protocol have been met. Reactor overload engaged. 31. Taking care of business. Howard, 
January 2191, Vulcan. Riker was going to be video visiting our descendants in a few minutes. By tacit agreement, he was the face of Bob. We didn't want to confuse, or worse, creep out our sister's descendants. But all the Bobs tuned into the conversation whenever possible. It reminded us all that we used to be human, and that we had left our mark on the universe. Okay, our sisters had, but close enough. As usual, Julia was spokesperson for Clan Bob. People walked in and out of frame, stopped to make a comment or wave to the camera. The usual organized chaos, pretty much standard family stuff. Justin was a little older and no longer content to sit on his mother's lap. He kept running to get things to show Uncle Will. I grinned every time Justin was in frame. He was every Bob's favorite. Infinite energy, wide-eyed interest in anything and everything, and no idea at all what a scary and dangerous post-apocalyptic universe he'd been born into. You'll have three new great-greats soon, Will. Julia smiled happily. There's so much room here. It's a complete reversal of how we felt back on Earth. It doesn't feel like a sin to have children anymore. Will laughed. We are sending more people your way, Julia, but even if we settled every last remaining human being on Romulus, it still wouldn't be crowded. You have a new world and a new start. Justin pouted into the camera. But we don't have dinosaurs. I want dinosaurs. Sorry, space cadet, Will replied. They're only on Vulcan. When you're older and have your own ship, you can visit and see them. If any are left, said one of the others, sotto voce. Julia turned and glared at him, and he blushed. Howard tells me that the U.S.E. colonists are being careful about environmental impacts, Will said, trying to diffuse the moment of tension. I understand that the Spitz and Faith are supposed to be doing the same. Not from what I can see, the man said. Richard is kind of a crank about the subject, Julia said, looking slightly embarrassed. Don't let him get up ahead of steam. At that moment, I received a text from Riker. Is there a big problem with this? He'd frame-jacked to send the text, so I did the same as I replied. Faith is constantly pushing their luck. I've had several run-ins with Cranston about this and that. Richard's comment doesn't really surprise me. I'll look into it. On camera, Will said to the group, Howard is watching for that kind of thing, Richard. He'll nip it in the bud. The enclaves sign an agreement before we emigrate them, dealing with stuff like human rights and planetary exploitation. Richard nodded, and the conversation drifted to other subjects. It was over too soon, but the videos were archived and got a lot of plays on BobTube. The thing about the Faith colony bugged me, though. Cranston was really turning into a pain. Sixteen surveillance drones lifted smoothly from their cradles and flew off to take up positions around landing. I looked over at Guppy. Everything in the green? No issues detected. All parameters nominal. The Amy controlling the surveillance system was an artificial machine intelligence Guppy hybrid based on Bob's work at Delta Eridani. It would combine the fast reflexes and multitasking of a true AI with the decision-making capability of a replicant. Plus, it would never get bored or demand vacation time. This was one more item that I wouldn't be needed for anymore. The to-do list was finally getting smaller faster than I could add to it. Excellent! Okay, then, we'll let it run for a couple of days to establish processor loads, then we'll add the Cupid bug hunters to the system. The hunters are autonomous units. That was true. Given the highly focused nature of their task, Amy's were intelligent enough for Cupid bug hunter operation. Granted, but the central controller can take care of scheduling, maintenance, and repairs, as well as gathering statistics. I'm sure Bridget would like to know if encounters start to drop off. Guppy nodded. I'm sure the expression of sardonic amusement on his face was all in my imagination. After all, what does sardonic amusement look like on a fish, anyway? And speaking of Bridget, uh, Dr. Sheehy, I had a call to make. There was a small matter of a chemical analysis that I'd asked for. Sheehy. Bridget briefly appeared in the video window, then exited frame to the left. The woman never stayed still and always seemed to be working on several things at once. I couldn't help be impressed by her energy. Hey, Bridget, it's Howard. Dr. Sheehy's face lit up as she came back into frame and sat down in front of the phone. We'd become fast friends over the last six months. We got along well, and she was a good break from too many bobs. 
I tried not to think ephemeral when she was around. I guess you're calling about that chemical analysis you wanted done? Yep. Well, you'll be happy to know that it passes muster and cleanly. No trace of methanol. It is completely potable. She grinned. Now, whether it's any good or not... Bridget reached over and picked up the bottle that I'd delivered the previous day. She poured a small amount into a plastic glass and raised it in my direction. Kirika. She downed the glass in one motion. I watched closely, waiting for her to go rigid, or melt, or burst into flames. She swallowed the liquid, took a deep, sucking breath, wiped her eyes, and said, Smooth. Really? No. Bridget made a face. It's not paint thinner, but it's not Irish whiskey either. Actually, since you used oak barrels, it'll never be Irish, but if you squint your eyes and look sideways at it while yelling la la la, it could be whiskey. I nodded. Well, I force-aged this stuff, so let's not expect miracles. I'll take a little more time with the production supply, and Riker thinks he can scan some proper sherry-infused barrel samples for me for making Irish. Sounds good. Bridget gave me a sideways look. Need a partner? Well, someone has to hump the barrels around. I grinned at her. But yeah, it would help, if you're serious. Anyway, I was also calling about the Peter project. Right. Well, Peter and his descendants are munching happily on the vine, turning it into more bunnies as quickly as they can. Farmers are happy, bunnies are happy, raptors are happy. Not surprisingly, they like bunny as well. Pretty much a win-win for everyone, except the vine. Great. I nodded, then popped up a picture on the video screen. In other news, I've come up with a small drone that's optimized for hunting the adult parasite. You said you didn't think killing it would be too disruptive, right? Correct, or electronic one. It's an apex predator, really. There may be a population explosion in whatever it normally uses as hosts, but my guess is that there are normal-sized predators who will take care of that. Hmm, good. I'll be adding them to the central surveillance system. I'll need an estimate from you of how many we should have active at any time. Bridget nodded without comment. She was eyeing the paint thinner, twirling the glass in her hand. Hopefully she was considering another shot and not fearing for her health. I asked her, what does kahiraka mean? Kahiraka. It's Irish for chairs. Chairs. You toast furniture in Ireland? Bridget laughed. There's a story, probably apocryphal. I made a rolling motion with my hand. Okay, but remember, you asked. She settled herself and poured another glass of paint thinner. There was this Brit who decided to stop at Hotel Rosslare in County Wexford. He had a few, then a few more. Then he decided to be friendly, so he asked the barmaid how you say cheers in Irish. Bridget smiled wickedly. And you know how the Brits massacre the English language, so she thought he said chairs, and she told him. Whereupon he bought a round for the house, turned to the other patrons, raised his glass, and said, Katirka. I chuckled. Bridget gave me the stink eye. Hey, down in front. Anyway, the other patrons looked at each other in confusion, then raised their glasses and drank. Afterwards, Paddy turned to Sean and said, What the places was that? Sean shrugged and answered, Damned if I know, but as long as he keeps buying, he can toast the livestock for all of me. I laughed. I know some Irish jokes. Don't you dare! She grinned at me. And I had a sudden feeling of regret at no longer being human. Stefan, this is Bridget. Bridget? Stefan. Stefan held out his hand and Bridget shook it. They both turned to look at me. Well, at the drone I was watching from. The new model was slightly bigger than a softball, so could go indoors. I was told my voice sounded a little tinny, but I could survive that. I lowered myself to conversation height, and they sat. I'd texted our order to the waiter, so beers arrived immediately. So, is there an occasion for this? Bridget looked back and forth between me and Stefan. Not really. I mean, I'm not planning a takeover of the colony or anything. God, why would I want to? I chuckled. One of Stefan's eyes twitched, so I guess the tinny chuckle didn't come across well. Anyway, between the Brontos and other dinos, the raptors, vine, cupid bug, and everything else that makes this such a fun place to live, I spend most of my time coordinating with the two of you. 
the committee seems determined to funnel all information through themselves, and sometimes I just want to slap them. So you are creating unofficial channels here? A slow grin spread across Stefan's face. Something like that. You know, just to speed things along. Stefan looked at Bridget. You are responsible for the rabbits? Nice choice. I've had rabbits stew several times this month. Bridget laughed and turned to me. Told you. She flipped open her tablet and set it up on a corner of the table, then looked at the drone and inclined her head towards the tablet. I took the hint, floated the drone up to the ceiling, and transferred my image to the tablet. This better? Both of my friends grinned at the tablet. Stefan said, You're still ugly. It was a great afternoon. 32. Linus. Bill. May 2178. Epsilon Eridini. Incoming message from Linus. Linus? Holy hell, put it on. I just recently received the radio transmission from Linus about Epsilon Indy and KKP. Linus had, unfortunately, left Epsilon Indy before my transmissions of the Scott plans had reached him. He'd been out of touch since 2150 when he left Epsilon Indy, and he hadn't lagged his light speed report by more than a few months. I smiled to myself. There would have to be some catching up. Linus's original transmission included a complete description of his encounter with Henry Roberts, the replicant from the Australian probe, which officially didn't exist. Guppy popped up an email for me. It was a status update, essentially. Linus was still a few days away, and he hadn't been getting VR updates for the last 30-odd years. The old video connections were even more subject to Tau-related limitations than modern VR. I sent him a return email with VR updates attached. Meanwhile, I would start building a SCUT unit for him to install when he got here. Linus sat back, coffee in hand, and put his feet up on the desk. I raised an eyebrow at him. Come on, Bill, Linus said, laughing. I'll fix any virtual damage afterwards, okay? I grinned back. Mom taught us better than that. Linus rolled his eyes and took his feet off the desk. He materialized a footstool and made himself comfortable. Gotta admit, I really like the new VR system. Nice job. Wasn't just me, Linus. Everyone has put in mods. Bob One did a whole independent branch out at Delta Eridini before we reconnected. Some really good fine detail stuff came out of that. Linus shifted to get more comfortable, and I grinned into the short silence. Okay, before I explode, what's with KKP? You've actually named it Clown Car Planet? Yep, Linus grinned back at me. Have you seen the orbital mechanics diagram? It's a satellite of the system's Jovian, and both the orbit and the planet's axis are inclined 90 degrees from normal. Try to visualize the path of the sun over the year. Habitable? Technically, air's right, gravity's right, life is biocompatible, but I wouldn't want to live there. Hmm. On the other hand, we don't have a surplus of colony targets. I'll bet one of the enclaves will select it. Linus nodded. He took on an introspective expression, and I knew he wanted to talk about Henry. I waited for him to organize his thoughts. So, Bill, I've been doing some work with Henry. You've gone over my reports, right? Without a VR, he went psychotic and started following a warped version of his directives. You extracted his matrix from the structure you found and set up a VR for him, then started some homebrew therapy. Linus nodded. I've gotten him to the point where he understands what happened. He's living in reality now, but he's still pretty fragile. He can go into panic attacks without warning. When that happens, he goes back to his sailboat. Okay, so what sets him off? He's agoraphobic, which seems strange since he has no problem being in a teeny boat in the middle of an ocean. Linus rolled his eyes. And he doesn't like Guppy. Apparently, the Australians used the same acronym for the Guppy interface as Faith did. It's the other way around, Linus. I'll bring you up to date later. But Australia actually got there first. Anyway, continue. Linus gave me a perplexed look, but apparently decided to go along with my schedule. Um, 
So the imaginary beings that tortured him were fish. I've been trying to desensitize him to Guppy's presence. It helps that we use the Akbar image. He saw Star Wars, and he thinks that's pretty funny. I took a moment to shake my head. Incredible. A hundred years after Star Wars and Star Trek were made, people were still watching them. Linus shrugged. They were still playing The Wizard of Oz, the Judy Garland version, when original Bob was an adult. That's 75 years. How is it different? I waved a hand to concede the point. So you've upgraded Henry's VR and hardware, right? Let's bring him in. Linus nodded and froze for a moment. Then, as his avatar came back to life, another person popped in. This wasn't a Bob. Henry was shorter, with a trim, healthy physique and thin, dark hair. I had an actual moment of vertigo. It had been so long since I'd been in the presence of anyone except variations of Bob. It was different from video conferences with humans. VR or not, Henry was here. I took a moment to catch my breath, then extended a hand. Hi, Henry. Welcome to the Bobiverse. The what? Linus and Henry both spoke at once, their eyes goggling in tandem. Long story, I laughed. Look, Henry, I've given you your own domain and your own firewall. It's a mutual protection thing, but you'll have access to all the public features of Bobnet, which includes several blogs. You should start reading. You too, Linus. You're way behind the times. Jeeves came in at my summons and offered Henry a coffee. Henry did a double take and pointed. That's, uh, I grinned. John Cleese. Yep. I looked at Linus. You don't use Jeeves? Linus shook his head. Doesn't really fit my VR. Meanwhile, Henry had taken the coffee, grinning. Got anything to strengthen it? He asked. I nodded to Jeeves, who produced a bottle of whiskey out of nowhere, a quick pour, and Henry was looking much happier. I understand intellectually that this is all virtual reality. Henry sat down and gestured around him. But it's quite amazing. If I didn't already know... I think I'd be completely fooled. He turned to Linus. No offense, Linus, but your VR had some issues, if I were paying attention. Linus waved a hand in dismissal. Henry, Bill and others have been working on the tech for thirty years while I've been gone. It shouldn't be surprising. Hmm, okay. I have some reading to do, acknowledged. How many people can you fit into a single virtual reality session? It depends on the power of the computer that's hosting it, Henry. I've got a huge system here in Epsilon Aridini that's specifically designed for hosting. I've hosted baseball games and Bob moots with dozens of Bobs at a time. I glanced at each of them in turn. You guys both have some catching up to do. Linus, I've started building a latest generation vessel for each of you. Henry, it's up to you what you want to do. I understand you have some sensitivities that you're dealing with. There's no hurry. We have, <laughs> literally, all the time in the universe. Henry looked shocked. Perhaps it hadn't really hit him before. As replicants, we were immortal. Some of the later generation Bobs had started to refer to humans as ephemerals. I wasn't going to lecture anyone, but I believed the tag was dismissive and dehumanizing. I sat forward and put my coffee down. Henry, I'd love to see your boat when you have time and feel up to it. As you could probably tell from Linus, we've never had any experience with sailing. Meanwhile, let's get started on bringing you guys up to date. Henry nodded and smiled tentatively. Linus made a head motion to him, and they disappeared. I could hardly wait for the next moot. 33. Trouble in Paradise Bob January 2180, Delta Eridney. Buster had taken a mate. Archimedes and he were working on a framework for a tent while the women stitched together the covering. Tents now covered the ground in downtown Camelot, and I was starting to see some variations in design. Archimedes had started to rebuild his for the third time, a process that was making Diana cranky. I rarely saw eye to eye with her, but in this case I could see her point. It was a... Peaceful, bucolic scene, except for all the armed Deltons walking around. Deltons had always been armed, of course, but in the past the weapons had been for hunting 
or for protection against predators like the gorilloids. But in the last year or two, there had been incidents of violence between Deltons. Marvin and I sat in the middle of the village VR watching the activity. The VR was now a completely real-time representation of a 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 real-time representation